successor uh, to the Columbus Monument Association, which was the group that came together uh, way back in the 1920s uh, to uh, start raising money to erect a statue. I mean, there's a long history of, it actually began in 1910, uh, and it got delayed by World War I, it got delayed by another number of other reasons, and then uh, finally in uh, 19, uh, about 1931 or two. Uh, the group started to raise money. And my father was one of the people involved. Uh, they had set up kind of a military organization. They had uh, uh, 10 generals who were responsible to raise uh, 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 $1,000 a piece, uh, 15 generals rather. And then they broke that down to t uh, captains that had to raise $100 a piece. And they raised uh, over $21,000 to begin the uh, putting up the Statue of Columbus in Syracuse. And the very interesting part of it is, and we have all the records, you'll see people's names on there, thousands of people giving a nickel, 10 cents, a quarter, a few dollars here and there, even a $5 bill from, the, I guess, the more wealthy at that time. It's a great story of uh, the community involvement and the Italian involvement in uh, helping to raise the statue, which was then crafted uh, by uh, Renzo Baldi in Florence, Italy. And, they, and he was uh, partnered with uh, Dwight Baum. Uh, for those that uh, from uh, literary, he was the brother uh, of the Baum that did the Wizard of Oz. And uh, he was selected by the mayor at the time to join with Baldy in developing the old Columbus Circle here in Syracuse. Isn't that something? I loved Frank Baum's Wizard of Oz. I read the Oz books to my children when they were very little. And, you know, that story about the, the statue, the, the immigrants giving money from their threadbare pockets to, to erect it. And that's the, that, that story is so common in, in all of the cities uh, around the country. Now, uh, uh, Mr. Pietro Fessa, you are an attorney in the state of New York and are legal counsel for the Columbus Monument Corporation in this matter. 
You're also a native Syracusan, and you too are a direct descendant of one of the founders of the Columbus Mining Corporation. Can you tell us a little bit about your family tie to the CMC? Right, like the Pierrots, the Pietra Faces have been there since the beginning. It was my great uncle Joe who um, who had a factory in, in the North Side, which was peopled usually by immigrants at that time, uh, mostly Italians and some of the Germans um, that had come before them. And uh, he helped the final push. My father and my uncle were involved in the uh, annual wreath laying during the 50s and 60s and 70s. And then in the 80s and beyond, my brothers and I have uh, picked up the torch. So uh, I, like Nick, uh, you can see the, the statue of, uh, we, we both have replicas of the, of the statue. Baldy brought three replicas of the Columbus statue. So, um, you know, I, I had no choice because that statue sits in my dining room. He, Chris looks at me every day, <laughs> so <laughs> pointing, pointing his finger at me. And, uh, and, and so uh, I, I had no choice, but it, it was a, a truly a labor of love. Oh, God bless you both and, and your families. So, gentlemen, uh, let's let's talk about the, this this victory, the controversy and, and the victory in Syracuse. What had been, has been, the position of Mayor Ben Walsh and his administration regarding the Syracuse Columbus statue? On what basis did he claim to attempt to remove the statue? The, uh, the mayor was caught up in the uh, protesting during the George Floyd situation. Uh he was marching with the protesters. Uh, they ended up at the Columbus Monument one day, and some of them said, this monument's got to go, you know, the cancel culture uh, that was really prevalent then. And uh, he joined right in and said that uh, they gave him two days to take the statue down, and he said he couldn't do that, but he would. And then finally, uh, we had met with him a few days before Columbus Day, and, uh, and uh, he said he was still thinking what to do. And then the next day he announced that the statue had to come down. Uh, it was strictly for political purposes. It had no real uh, uh, anything behind it that I can see where he had any real good reason. And uh, once he announced that, uh, he left us with no other position. And Tony can speak to that, but to go the legal route. Right. Yeah, I, I think, Rob, one of the other things, Nick, Nick said it correctly, but, you know, we have on tape, he gave an interview to uh, uh, one of the newspaper reporters who had a uh, had a video on the newspaper site where he says he has uh, he basically has said that he doesn't like Columbus. What he understands Columbus did is deplorable. Didn't like what the statue said. Um, that's the only time he said it. He lets other people do the talking for him now, unfortunately. And I think what happened is he did get caught up in the George Floyd things in 2020. He was running for re-election in 2021. Uh, he, he's a man without a party. He ran as an independent. So obviously he's looking for voting blocks. And I think he, he grasped that the activist part of uh, town would be behind him. And I think that part of was part of his... Um, part of his uh, motivation, but I think he does harbor um, ill will towards towards Columbus. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure that's that's because, you know, he doesn't like what Christopher Columbus did because he doesn't know what Christopher right. Columbus did. I mean, I think if he knew it, any reasonable person would, would, ha would harbor no ill will towards this great historical icon. And the fact that he didn't say more uh, tells me that maybe, uh, maybe the truth started to reach his ears and he just pulled back. Because I've noticed that happens you know, in the very early days, uh, the detractors of Columbus would shout out, you know, Columbus was a, a racist, a rapist, a man or a murderer, a slaver. And now they pull back that language. The language that they use is uh, they say uh, Columbus represents this and that and the other thing. And, they, and they, because they know that they can't make those original claims anymore. So, OK, so what was the uh, response of the Columbus Monument Corporation to these claims of the Marxist mayor? Well, uh, obviously, obviously uh, right off the bat, uh, we disagreed with him. We attempted to change his mind, but uh, he had, uh, I guess, made his decision. And as Tony pointed out, he was running for re-election. So uh, he was playing to certain voting groups. And uh, again, it left us no choice. But uh, that's when uh, we approached uh, uh, several members of uh, the Columbus supporting group. And Tony uh, led the way uh, to bring about eight other uh, uh, attorneys, uh, Italian attorneys uh, in Syracuse, including two former uh, Supreme Court judges, uh, state Supreme Court, 
uh, one state senator and a number of other people that are very in tune with the law. And they put together a team of nine attorneys, and they've done a fantastic job. Yes, I, I would have to agree, Mr. Pirro. I think they did a, a great job. And uh, so uh, maybe this question I, I could direct more towards Mr. Pietrafessa. How, how did all of this play out in the courts? Well, we uh, the important thing for us, Rob, was that the statute, the city of Syracuse had made certain commitments to the statue in the past before Mayor Walsh came to office and actually before he came of age, quite frankly. Uh, it, it is the statue sits in two historic districts. Um, the city had made itself imposed upon itself the requirement that if they wanted to do something with city for this particular piece of city property, they had to go to the landmark board for permission. But most importantly, uh, in 1992, the monument was renovated with money from the state, from the Monument Association and, and in-kind services by the city. The Monument Association came up with uh, about a third of the mo money that was used. In doing that, the city gave the state the um, uh, uh, Neesman, uh, a protective easement saying they won't do anything to the statue, take it down. If it comes down, they'll put it back up for the useful life of the statue, but no less than 23 years. So that was part of uh, a central part of what we sued for. And the judge agreed with us that the Monument Association and now the corporation as its successor is a third party beneficiary of the of that contract. And there's no dispute on either side that the monument has not exceeded its useful life. So um, the mayor has not, the court found correctly that the city has an affirmative obligation to maintain that statute in its present form, in its present place. Right. Yeah. You know, that, that language uh, that, the, that the monument has not exceeded its, its useful life. I, I really, you know, there are two responses to that. Number one is we're still here. Italian Americans are still here. So certainly that monument means a great deal to us. But the other answer, the broader answer is, how can that monument ever exceed its useful life as long as the United States stands? Because Western culture was brought to the Americas by Christopher Columbus. And as long as we hold true to the values of Western culture, what I call the triune of Western culture, the, 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 the idea of Greco-Roman democracy and law, Judeo-Christian ethics and morals, and the notion that stems from those two things that all people are created equal by their creator. As long as we hold true to those three truths, that triune of Western culture, that statue will never exceed its useful life. And another thing that I thought was very interesting about Judge Neri's uh, decision was that he ruled that the city is going to have to preserve the statue and maintain it. Now, uh, what are your opinions, gentlemen, on that? Do you think that the city will live up to that obligation? Uh, well, we, we certainly hope so. Uh, I think, and Nick can speak to this in greater detail, but it has always been our, uh, when I say our, I, I mean the corporation and the 26 individuals, uh, citizen tax, pay, resident taxpayers of the city of Syracuse, like Nick uh, and others who stood with us, with the corporation in bringing this lawsuit. Um, the thing is this, is it has always been our position to that uh, the city can be added to the circle, add more stories to the circle. There's a park or an empty lot next door that they propose has been proposed as a park for years and years. There are there is room on Columbus Circle for every immigrant story. Syracuse is a city of immigrants, and we're happy uh, to have company as long as the Columbus Monument stays uh, as it is. We offered to the mayor uh, back in March of last year, <clears throat> leave the statue, uh, let's not uh, go any further with this lawsuit, and then we will help to raise money for what he called a heritage park on the small lot that's right next to uh, where the Columbus uh, Circle is. And uh, he, he just actually re he sent through somebody else a rejection, so to speak. And, and it's, uh, it's too bad because we really could all come together, but uh, he's again uh, dividing people, uh, and uh, so we we continue to uh, you know move ahead. Uh, we're very pleased with the judge's decision, and uh, we stand by our, our our promise that we would uh, help to develop the area and raise money for it uh, if he would uh, just uh, decide to move uh, move on. Apparently, he's not going to do that. And, and Rob, there's, we still have some arrows in the quiver, uh, if you read in the decision, with the third-party beneficiary status with the state-city contract. 
we have an, a, a right to injunctive relief. So if the city fails to take care of the monument, we can go in and do it and build the city, or we can ask a judge to direct the city to do it. And likewise, uh, there is a provision in the city charter, which is applicable to our individual petitioners, where they can bring an action to prevent the city from laying waste to the monument. So um, we hope we never have to use those two those two items, but uh, we want the city to be sure to know that they are there. And I think they know now we're prepared to, to take action if we need to. One, one thing along that point, uh, the other day there were a bunch of protesters there and they placed uh, signs and, and other things on the monument. Uh, and uh, a few days later, the Syracuse Police Department, without, I believe, nothing to do with the mayor, they put out a, a press release saying that anybody who desecrates the monument, I mean, the Syracuse police will step in and take appropriate action. So I give them a lot of credit because they recognize that these people were breaking the law. Thank goodness. It, some sanity is returning to municipal governance, it seems, but not apparently from the mayor. You know, what you said, Mr. Piero, that the mayor is dividing people. Uh, that's exactly right. You know, these these Marxist mayors, they like to build themselves as progressive. But this is what I call opposite speak from the Marxist left. It's, uh, you know, uh, uh, Orwell called it double speak in his book, but I call it opposite speak because that's precisely what it is. They They do one thing and they call it the exact opposite, which is exactly what they've done to Christopher Columbus. They called him a racist when he was the opposite of that. He actually promoted, uh, he loved the Tainos and promoted brotherhood between the, the Europeans and the Tainos. They call him a, a, a rapist and a maimer and a murderer and a, and, a, and a genocide heir and a grifter. And he fought against the Spanish Hidalgos who attempted to do all those things. This is yet another example of opposite speak. They're not progressives at all. They're regressives and they are regressing into tribalism, which is another way of saying that he's dividing people, which is the language you use. So, you know, we really, when you look at how the Italian American communities in, in cities across the country have handled this controversy, it shows you who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. The bad guys are obviously the Marxist regressives who call themselves progressive, but are pushing for separation and, and, uh, and tribalism. And the good guys here are the Italian American communities who are saying things like, look, we will fund out of our own organization's pockets, additional monuments to the tribal peoples or other artistic displays that you could put side by side by our statues. That is inclusion, not the nonsense that the diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion types claim to push. They're pushing uh, the opposite of that. That's more of their opposite speak. And I have seen uh, photos of those statues you referred to, Mr. Piro, that uh, one of them, I think, said, uh, honor the indigenous peoples, and another one uh, was, uh, was something about uh, inclusion. And, you know, that's precisely what Columbus stood for. He did honor the, I'm gonna, I call them the tribal peoples because they weren't really indigenous, but, you know, that, that doesn't diminish their, their contribution to the Americas and, and to the world at all. I just want to be precise in my language, but he did honor them. I mean, he, he protected them. He, he didn't want to displace them. Uh, you know, he worked with Chief Wakanagari to, to find a, a patch of land that the settlers could settle on that would not displace the Taino tribes. Uh, you know, that's, that's an example of honoring. I can't imagine uh, if, if faced with those facts that these Marxist regressives could deny that that's what better way could you honor people by going to their representative and saying, we want to settle side by side peacefully with you. Uh, show us where we can where we can pitch our tents. And uh, and he also, uh, as I've said many times on the show, he 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 promulgated or, or he successfully petitioned the king of Spain to promulgate the first civil rights legislation of the Americas. And what better way to honor and include the tribal peoples of the Americas than with a, a royal decree that says all the tribal peoples of Hispaniola are to be left free, unmolested and unharmed, and permitted to live like freemen, just like all others in the kingdom of Castile. That, that, so that they don't even know what they're saying. It's opposite speak. So, all right. Rob, yes. Rob, let me just add from a local perspective, the Onondaga Nation, which is headquartered here in our community, uh, part of the Iroquois Nation, uh, Confederacy, 
uh, they were involved from day one. Chief Jesse Lyons. Uh, we've got pictures from the day of the dedication with two of the chiefs there uh, in full headdress. And they made the sculptor an honorary chieftain of the Onondaga tribe. Uh, when we did the quincentennial, the chief uh, or uh, Chief uh, Urban Paulos Jr. was on the committee. So the Onondagas have been involved with us from day one. It's only a few radicals now that uh, we uh, they claim this, but the Onondaga leadership has never come out against the Columbus thing. In fact, Warren Lyons is quoted as saying, uh, we have nothing to do with Columbus, Columbus Day or anything. That's up to uh, the, the state and local governments. Yeah, there you go. And you know what I think is really telling? There were a number of organizations that came out uh, against uh, against the, the statue and, and was were protesting Judge Neri's decision. One of them calls themselves neighbors of the Onondaga nations, which is very deceptive because it's not the Onondaga nation. It's some other group of people, I submit Marxists, who are calling themselves neighbors of the Onondaga nation. And if you're not reading carefully, if you're not paying very close attention, you might think it's the Onondaga nation itself, and it's not. So I think that's a very important point, and I thank you for that, Mr. Pira. So, all right, what's coming down the pike for this case? Can you tell me? Yeah, the city hit, the city wasted no time. Within an hour of the decision being filed, they they uh, they filed the notice of entry, which starts the clock on the appeal. And then 15 minutes after that, they filed their notice of appeal. So they will be taking the court to the, uh, they will taking this case to the fourth department, the appellate division, which is the first level appellate uh, court in the states of New York and Rochester. The, uh, the idea would be, or their argument would be that Judge Neary made some mistakes. He abused his discretion either in misapplying the law, ignoring law or certain facts, um, or, or showed some kind of bias or whatever. But uh, we, you know, we, we're analyzing the decision. We're analyzing where we think they might go. We think the judge, I will say this, um, and I've been in front of Judge Neary several times as the attorney for the city has, right? We both know him very well. And what he is, is a very careful guy who reads everything. He was very patient with us, uh, with both sides throughout the, the case. He was generous with his time and also with the docket there are over 150 items in the docket a lot of it were exhibits the city probably had close to 60 or 70 exhibits on on their own so which which the judge had read all of them he came to the court it was a, what we call a hot bench he knew exactly where he wanted to go with it had pertinent questions for each of us uh his his um his decision is redolent of sites to the record um, so he's not just writing this off the seat of his pants. So I think I, we feel confident that his decision will be affirmed by the uh, appellate division, which generally speaking, how long will it take? I'd say probably, you know, it'd be the end of the year before we, before we get in front of the, uh, the bench. All right. Well, there you have it. Well, we wait with bated breath and hopefully, uh, in the meantime, people will behave themselves around that statue. I understand that, uh, Somebody put duct tape over the faces of Christopher Columbus and the king and queen of Spain and the Spanish sailors on the little uh, bronze plaques that, uh, that adorn the pedestal and even over the, the, the Catholic cross. Uh, this is an act of damnatio memoriae. It is as old as time itself. It, it's the obliteration of memorials to one group by another that seeks to supplant it. So uh, I think, however, that the, the city of Syracuse and the Christopher Columbus Monument and the Italian-American community of Syracuse is in very good hands with you, Mr. Pietrafessa, and uh, with, with you uh, heading, or at least as one of the heads of the Columbus Monument Corporation, Mr. Piero, uh, just like the great General Pierce, uh, I, I think, uh, I think we're, we're going we're gonna to continue our victories and, and uh, may God grant that. So is there anything you'd like to say before we sign off? Just thank you for uh, bringing this to attention of more people. Uh, we were getting support from all kinds of uh, ethnic groups here in Syracuse. Uh, they have signed petitions for us. And uh, people understand that there's there's no need to be doing this. Plus, the mayor's spending a lot of taxpayer dollars with outside law firms to try to defeat us, and he's losing. And uh, he will continue to lose, and uh, uh, the good will win out in this case. 
your lips to God's ears. Listeners, when you listen to that, think to yourselves, who is truly on the side of inclusion here? And that's today's class. For more news, articles, and resources about Christopher Columbus as the first civil rights activist of the Americas, icon of Western culture, paragon of Catholic virtue, and greatest hero of the 15th and 16th centuries, visit preservecolumbus.us. That's preserve Columbus, rendered as one word, dot US, and post a little note of appreciation for our webmaster, Tom LaCosta. And gentlemen, is there a website for the Columbus Monument Corporation that our listeners could go to? Yes, it's columbusmonumentsyracuse.com. Columbus Syracuse.com. Also thank on you. Facebook, right? Okay, there you go. There you have it. Gentlemen, thank you so much. You guys are my heroes. And if there's anything I could do to help my fratelli in Syracuse, do not hesitate to reach out. And I'm your professor, Robert Patron. A presto! The Jersey Shore has born and sun, sand and sea. Italian. This is Radio Voice Italia, USA.